This podcast is brought to you by LMU Munich. First of all, I want to thank you for the honor to giving the opening keynote at PyCon DE 2016 in Munich. And welcome you all to the Ludwig Maximilians University. We are proud to have you here. I've worried a bit about giving the keynote. I'm neither the president of the Plown Foundation nor the release manager who normally does that. I'm not amongst the smartest people in the Plown community. A lot of them, much smarter persons than me, sitting in this auditorium. And I bet they would give a better keynote than me in a technical sense. But I was asked to give you an introduction to the Plown community and the junction with the general Python community. And as I start to prepare the keynote, I was really looking how to tell it, and I see it is almost impossible without doing the conjunction between the ZOAP and the Plone community with the general uh, Python community, because there's so much overlap, there's so much history in common with them, so that you can't tell the story of the one without the story of the other. So, how I want to start, or first question a bit in the auditorium, who of you know Zope and Plone? Wow. How many of you have either contributed to one or two of those communities? Okay, thanks. So let's start with a bit of history. Where we start from? Well, it is 1990. It's a Christmas project by Guido van Rossum, who has playing around and trying to define a new teaching language inspired by ABC. And he named it in honor after Monty Python's Flying Circus. So the python, the snake, is nice, but that's the origin. Fast forward, in the year 1996, this man, the CTO of Digital Creations in Fredericksburg, Virginia, is on a plane to the International Python Conference in California, Jim Fulton. He's scheduled to give a tutorial about CGI programming, because there was nothing else in this time. And so he spends, as usual in the community, the flight to the conference on reading and learning the specification. He got some ideas about how to improve it, and on the flight home, he designs what becomes Bobo, the first Python web object publishing system. In the same year, someone else from Digital Creations participates in a World Wide Web Consortium and Open no, Object Management Group working group specified in modern object publishing on the web. That's Paul Everett. And that's the birth of modern object publishing in the web. And in some way, it's also the base for what we today call REST. But how that starts and how it goes on, it's funny. This disk is a good example of it. Bobo had the commercial twin, it's called Principia. Digital Creations was asked to sell Principia to the United States Navy for 20,000 bucks. This CD, uh, this disc did not look $20,000 worth. So, actually on this disc there was Bobo, or Principia, and the Python interpreter in total. But it didn't fill up the disk. But can you sell a disk for 20,000? No. So they decided to burn it on a CD and sell it to make it a bit more looking like $20,000 worth. 
So, but what is Prince Ipke? Or what has it to do with our community? Well, Digital Creations received large venture capital investments of more than $750,000 uh, in the late 90s, so it's much money in that time. In 1998, the largest investor in digital creation convinced the CEO, Paul Everett, to release Principia software as open source. Principia and Bobo became the Z object publishing environment. In 1999, Zope was born. Digital Creations was later renamed the Zorp Corporation. And the Zorp Corporation consists of a lot of fabulous people, persons. And they do hire the Python Labs community, which was laid off by another company. So you see in there a lot of names that have a name in the Python community, starting with the Zope people, Jim Fulton, Paul Everett, Tress Siever, Chris McDonald, but also the people around the core of Python, Guido van Rossum, uh, Barry Watzlaw, Jeremy Halton, Fred Drake, and Tim Peters. Yeah, so Zope Corporation paid for Python Labs for more than three years, their full salary, and keep Python going. I say that's a solid contribution to the Python community. Guido always said like that, Python's regrets. I think there is no regret about that. Thank you. In 1999, also two other people met. Alex Limian and Alan Runyon, they met on IRC. They're chatting about music and web technologies. They're looking for doing something called web publishing. They started to do it together. Alex Limi sitting in Norway, Alan Runyon sitting in Texas. They looked around, found Zoop, and started to build on top of that a CMS, which becomes Plone. The pl first public release of Plone is October 4th, 2001. So, you can calculate, it's 15 years later today. Happy birthday, Plone. We've almost grown up. <laughs> but if we look, what makes Plone still around? So, what is Plone? And why is it still around? why we are here today in some way. The question is, why? And I will focus on two of them for answering. It's the technology and it's the community. But first, talk a little bit about technology. But if you speak about technology, we should say first what Plone is not. Plone is not a web framework. A lot of people insist or think Plone is a web framework. Indeed, it's not. Plone is a content management system. And especially with the focus on management system, most CMS are just web publishing platforms. Plone is much more in a sense. All the power that you see and why the people think Plone is a web framework is because Plone feels like a content integration framework. It's a multi-tool that gives you a lot of power and doing stuff with it, but in the context of managing content. And we know, as computer scientists, the one important thing we should know is to choose the right tool for the job. And if we think about that, it's a question of adaptation. It is that we think what could 
enhance us, what can make us better. If we're looking outside, we have a best of breed all around. There are technologies that is the best at the moment, that is the technology to go forward. And you should sometimes abandon also your own product to go in favor for a better one that makes your work, your requirements fit better. And that was so in the beginning. And I want to speak a bit about the technologies behind. Why Zoop was that fabulous for the beginning? The first thing is traversal. Look at this simple expression. In your ads we see that and call it pass. You can see it looks like a file system path. Static web servers like Apache, Engine X or others serve static uh, content by walking the file system. Following this path and returning the item at the end of the path as an HTTP response. CGI in the beginning, I said before, CGI was the dominant web technology for non-static content. Do it the way, uh, do it the same way. Expect the path ends in an executable script that generates HTTP headers and a response body. So, traversal is the one thing, the idea of walking a file system. Jim Fulton on that airplane back in 1996 asked himself a question. Could we treat Python objects the same way? If we have a database that allows to store Python objects the same way, and we combine that with objects that can behave like Python digs, that's the set object public, uh, database. Could we not then transform this file system hierarchy into a series of nested objects? Treating path segments like keys would allow us to walk the chain of contained objects just like walking the file system. Then, when we uh, have the right object found, what should we do with it? Entering object publishing. The part that remains is the object publishing themselves. We find the object using traversal. Then we call the object, passing in the request, which contains environmental information, to generate a publishable representation of itself. Finally, we use that representation as the response we send back to the client. That's the concepts behind SOAP. And SOAP has a lot of fantastic features. One of the base things for Plon was method and attribute level security. You have a very detailed role and permission setting from the very beginning. Security was by design, not a layer on top of it. But the other thing, and even more important for Plon, was a thing called TTY, through the web. Whom of you from outside SOAP and Plon community knows the term TTY or through the web and might have the understanding of it? That's the problem we always hear. It means nothing to people outside of our community, but it was the killer feature of SOAP. And it became, it, uh, because it allows you to program in the browser, so you are not necessarily need a command line, a different uh, IDE or something to program in. You just open the browser and can program within it. Today, that's, for example, the core feature of Jupyter Notebook, programming through the web. But that's without the security layers. Well, what was another problem? At the point where that started off, Python was not that popular as today. There were two other languages that were much more popular. So, SOAP 2 
the Python web application server implemented or digital creations it indeed paid 100,000 US dollars for implementing a runtime environment for Perl and PHP inside Zelp. Actually, just two people used it. Well, Zelp became very popular, not because of Perl or PHP, but because it allows new developers to build powerful applications with only a browser. It lowered the bar to get started with web development. The Zelp and CMF, the content management framework on top of Zelp, provided all sorts of great tools to create content, control its publication, set its display, add interactivity via user's input, theme the resulting web application, and, you see, it looks terrible. <laughs> Sorry. Even it looks still like that today. <laughs> and that was one of the reasons for Plone. Plone wraps the cool, technical features of Zoop and provided a nice user interface. After Plone's first public release in October 2001, it quickly gained user and mind share and in some way took over a lot of the community and events. But that is how Plone has looked like in that case. The most distinguishing feature was in-place content creation. Users could navigate with their browsers to the place they want to add an item and uh, edit it, change how it looks, allow it uh, to it allow access to it and publish it right there. And for the users that not come from the Plone content, didn't look this design a bit uh, familiar to you? Yeah. But if you look in the Wikipedia source code, it says it takes the styling and everything from Plone. Plone was before. Actually, Alex, let me granted them some of the styles to use it because Alex Lemmy in that time was one of the most advanced people in user experience and accessibility. And that also had bootstrapped other foundations. So if you look at that, that's the view. That's the edit interface. It's the same. You're working just in the front end. There is no dedicated back end. Well, Plone involved. The design changed, or the appearance changed over the time. But the idea of empowering users remains constant. That is how Plone 5 looks today. Like soap, Plone benefits from a mix of being easy to pick up, but powerful enough for serious work. Attracted by its simplicity, flexibility, and above all unparalleled security, companies, schools, governments, and nonprofits adopted Plone, and the Plone community grew quickly. But there has always to be a but. Here's the story about the but. The PyCon 2000. Ah, well, no. Make that later. If we look at Plone, Today, I said, one of the big stories was to work through the browser on everything. And that's one of the core features that remains. You can manage all your content types. You can create new content types through the web. There is another technology called Diazo that separates the concerns of one and the other. Diazo is a technology that gives a designer the capability to just write HTML to design a web page and just integrate it with a small set of rules with your content management system. There's a lot about that. You just take the vanilla system, a theme, set of rules, and it makes the system. 
And the Diazo integration in Plone makes it again possible to define the whole look and feel through the web. And another main feature is it is still about managing content, not only publishing it. But if you see a te technology that does not describe why Plone is still around, there's a lot of fantastic products, uh, fantastic ideas around that did not survive the first three years. So why is Plone still around? It's the community. And if we look into the community, we can phrase it like the community. Lawrence said it right. You can take the man out of Plown, but you can't take Plown out of the man. The community members might leave, but they might do other things, but they still belong to the family. They still do the things the Plown way. Reliable, approachable. But where did this come from? In some way, it comes from the founders. But Plone has two founders, but we don't have a beloved dictator for life. Remember, Plone is 15 years old. The founders on active community contribution left more than five years ago. How many communities survived the leave or uh, the departure of their founders? Not a lot. So who leads the community and directs the product Plone? Is it the Plone Foundation Board of Directors? No, it's not. Is it the release managers? No, they just form the discussion in some way. It's the community, the community of all together, sharing different ideas, different opinions. And this picture of the community says it in some way right. That's in Arnheim. There's a sentence above the community uh, from a World War II history. It's in Netherlands. It says, the most men's in Sweden, in inkling, dead and that. In English, most people stay silent. Only a few act. And that's how it is in open source, the world. There's thousands, millions of users of open source. It's only a few persons that actively contribute to it. And those community stay strong together and help each other. And the community knows how to party, how to come together, how to make those feelings of a family. And in Arnheim, we did this, get this quote. I don't know what you folks are doing, but I want to be a part of it. And it's the spirit of Plone that makes that so funny. 2013 in Brazil, we had a conference, the first South Equator. Governmental officials, ministries, um, secretaries joined the opening ceremony for the Plon Conference, and everything. But the most of the spirit you feel in the evening on a parking lot just behind the trainer's hotel where we have a grill, stick on meat, and beers. That was the point where the community joins. And there's a very, very old joke about the Plone community. Plone is a drinking game with a software problem. And it's about approachability. On the right, that's Rio Paca. It's one of our active members. He joined 2014 in the conference in Bristol, years after the founders left. That's the conference, the Bo Plone conference in Boston last week. The right, no, the left is Alexander Limi, one of the founders. He came back 
to celebrate with the family, and so on. But it's the thing that all the people in the community are not rock stars. They are approachable. Everybody can talk with each other. They're sitting in the evening together, sharing beers. And that's a lot of the thing. And I could imagine the same. Rio Packer tweeted this picture and said, now I know how a teenage uh, Justin Bieber fan feels when meeting his idol. I'm not sure that Justin Bieber uh, would behave like him. Alex Lim is definitely a better uh, and approachable person. <laughs> But on a side story, we all in the community know something like that. It was 2013 for me. Max, another of the hosts here, uh, and I arrive, arrived early in Brasilia. On the first evening, we went to a gas station just across the street to grab some beers. We met there Alan Runyon, one of the two founders. We, ourselves, even if we have already attended a few conferences before, feel like newbies. We haven't contributed anything to the core of Python. We are not any famous person in the community. Alan remembers us. He sit down there at this gas station, sharing beer and talked more than two hours with us. Newbies, no ones in the community. But that's a feeling of getting into a family. That makes it so funny. And as we said before, a community that rise, that's become larger and larger, spin off, and that was a problem in some way. 2000, the International uh, Python Conference 8 in Arlington, Virginia, has almost doubled the numbers of attendees. 2000, uh, 1999, IPC7 was around 100 attendees. 2000, it was 250. More than 90 persons attended for a separated track dedicated on ZOAP. It's the first split off in the Python community itself. It's long before the other communities like Django, PyData, Scientific Python, and so on, that have own conference series split it up. It's the first time. We, for a long time to, uh, there, have been an active part of the Python community. We did get 2000 our own track. We did continue it till 2003. 2003 was the first dedicated Py a plan conference. We split up. We were indeed much larger than the IPC8 in the beginning. At the moment, we started off our own conferences. It was 2003, oh, New Orleans, for 2004, 2005, Vienna, Seattle, Naples, Washington DC, Budapest, Bristol, San Francisco, Arnheim, Brasilia, Bristol again, Bucharest, and Boston. That spins plown around the world. And that's just the annual conference. There's a lot more, much, much more. You know, the term sprint was coined by the ZOP people and getting more and more attraction by the Plon and Python people. The picture is from the old castle sprint back in 2003 where a lot of daddy, uh, the, mm, distinguished soap and plone people attend a castle in Austria invited by a prince, a real prince, to work on soap and plone. They do that on their own money. Could you imagine back in that time that was something so weird that an Austrian TV uh, channel gone there and filmed it, make interviews with them. It's still around on YouTube. Yeah, it 
was really weird back then. Spending your free time and your own money to travel to an old castle, sitting with other nerds around, programming a software? Well, the time has changed. We see today open source is more in common. Everybody, new developers, grew up. They are born with a GitHub account in some way. <laughs> Nowadays, if you look at them, or the things, if you look at, at bug reports on GitHub, it sometimes feels like everybody expects you to work for free to do their job. But well, there is a lot of different sprints and we just did another castle sprint three months ago. But well, we have learned a lot of lessons from it. First lesson was even within this community. In 2003, the idea of ZOAP, the mistakes that ZOAP has already done, shouldn't be repeated. Paul Everett has given a talk about the perfect distance. You should have a distance between a product and the company behind it. They bootstrapped the Plone Software Foundation. In opposite to ZOAP, the ZOAP Corporation holds the copyrights and every, uh, intellectual property on the ZOAP code at that time. The Plone community transfers their intellectual property rights, their trademark rights, to the new formed Plon Foundation. It's an elected group by the community that just is there to manage the money, manage and protect the trademark, and do nothing more. They are not leading the community. They are not saying in which direction Plon should go. They just protect the brand. And one of the first steps was Alex Limi, at that moment, had a company called Plon Solutions. And there should be a perfect distance. So they renamed itself to John. We are back more and more into Python. We see that through the web has a lot of disadvantages. You do not have version control. You do not have the uh, proper way of documentation for your stuff. So we go back into that, and we go back into the general community. And we started with lots of things. If you learned a lot of things, you do mistakes, what's the best thing to do? Interact with others, learn from them. Mentoring, that was one of the strengths in the Plone community. Mentoring the new ones, we started that with others. Communities that just were very, very small grown up by mentoring by the Plown community in some way. And we bootstrapped several other institutions and organizations. Uh, there are indeed, I think, the Python Software Verband, so the German uh, institution that does uh, protect uh, and do all the stuff around Python today in Germany was bootstrapped by those people that has done before the DZUG, Deutsche Zob User Group. So that's come from there. I have learned once, it's a matter of the success, where to get from. There's one thing I always remember around that. Surround yourself with the right people, people that are smarter than you. People that you look up to. People that get you out of your comfort zone. And, most important, people that make you smile. So is Plone for me. And that's why I'm standing here. I said, I'm not one of the smart people. I'm just one of the servants for the community. And try to help them, managing them. So, if we look at Plone, and so we do see that a lot of people in the back, and even today, 
are not happy with plants. They have lots of complaints. But the most important one, and one of the problematic is, Plon is not hip anymore. Could it attract new people? Well, actually, Plon is boring. But hell, yeah, a lot of technologies are boring. Even Python is boring. But, yeah, boring did not mean bad. But it doesn't also mean good. Python is a fantastic, boring technology. PHP, in the opposite, is not that fantastic. But it's not that bad as it was once. There is this uh, a book from Dan McKinley, Choose Boring Technologies. It described that the company get around three innovation tokens if they start. And you have to spend innovation tokens if you choose a technology to solve your stuff, to do your product. And if you choose a technology, a hip technology, you just spend one of your innovation tokens. If you have spent all of them and you're not finished, you're dead in some way. So if you choose Node.js, if you choose Angular, Non-stable technologies that change, that are still in the flow, you spend an innovation token. If you choose a technology that is not really ready, like MongoDB in some way, you just spend one uh, innovation token. And hell, if you try to start to develop your own database, goddamn, you're in trouble. <laughs> so yeah, boring. Get your things done. Boring even pays your bills. So boring is not the th wrong thing. But is a boring system interesting? Essentially, is it attractive to be involved and to attract new users and the developers? Actually, yes, it is. It's like the cruising ship. It's a very pleasant way of seeing the world in some way. And it belongs with other thing. A complex system that works is invariably found to have evolved from a simple system that works. A complex system designed from scratch never works and cannot be patched to make it up, or to, up to make it work. You have to start over with the working system. Sometimes it's called the law of John Gall. And it's right. There's other uh, things like inside every well-written large program is a well-written small program. Oh. And that's the thing. Zoop steps on top of Python, a fantastic technology. Plone, standing off the shoulders of giants of the Zoop community, of the ideas and technologies there. And that's fantastic. But what's behind that? So could it be innovative? Yes. The plant community was always innovative. They wrapped technologies, ideas around. They were always in the innovators and early adopters of new technologies. And there's a gap to the other one. So if you go in there, you have to look about new technologies, finding ideas. But that doesn't say you have to completely switch in the beginning. You stay conservative. You look at the technologies. You find the best examples and include them. So, from future import features, where we go on. There's lots of technologies that had has developed first as an add-on and now is in the core. And so it's the process in the plant community. We normally have three to five years before an idea is born and going into the core of it. And that's make it rock solid. The examples like Dexterity, Diazo, Atus. At the moment, it's Mosaic and REST API that's going into that direction. So keep calm and try new things. 
and it's all about a rapid turnaround. And that was what SOAP gives you in the beginning, which Python and Plon gives you. There's a video from John Kelly, uh, director in the NASA Jet Propulsion uh, Libra uh, Laboratory, that made a video 2006 about web technologies and concepts. And the most important sentence is, it's all about rapid turnaround. Stay vital. Make it possible to do software so that the user experience did not suck. The another problem, Plon has a step learning curve. Plon is very complex. Yeah, how? It's the same. Plon is hard, complex, complicated. But it's about innovations. If you start very first, so was an innovation driver. Yeah, hell. You start before others. Could you remember? I said Tim Peters was with PyLabs in the SOAP Corporation. The Zen of Python was written with SOAP in mind. All the mistakes we have done, so not to repeat them. We had the problem. SOAP started with Python 1. All the stuff about the new shiny web technologies, yes, are features that came with Python 2, Python 2.6 and up, Python 3. We are in a time long before of that. We do have to replicate things that are there today. Soap daytime was much or was already major before daytime comes into the standard library and a lot of other things. And that's another thing. There was the quote from the Python community back then, where SOAP leads, Python follows. But that's SOAP, that's not Plone. What is the thing then with that? Well, the problem is every technology or every piece of SOAP that's not got the, adopted by the Plone community is literally that. And, well, we have learned from our mistakes and we keep our users and developers in mind. That's where we want to go through. And, you know, if you become more older, more professional, what's distinguish you, a professional, a master, from a novice? Well, we just have tried more often that the novice has failed. So, if you look into the future, Plone will stay, and Plone has a roadmap, 2020. It's about 100% Python 3 compatibility. We are still on Python 2 board. It's about Mosaic, so user experience, make it better. So Plone will stay, and Plone will remain a first-class citizen of content management and Python web. And I want to invite you to join the Plone community and join the journey. There are lots of events coming up, like the next Plone Open Garden after Eastern, the next Plone Conference in Barcelona, and a lot of sprints, Alpine City Sprint, and so on. There's a variety, almost one sprint per month in the community. Come and join. And thank you all. Thanks a lot, Alexander. Um, I think we are almost out of time, so let's just have uh, two questions. Please raise your hands. The first one is a lucky one. Questions? Come on, guys, don't be so shy. Was it so clear that there are no questions? Plon is, is complex, as Alexander told. It is quite complex. Come on, guys. Well, uh, there are much more smarter people in the auditorium yes. that can explain the yes, technologies. Yes. Okay, so. then uh, I just do uh, a little announcement. So since we need to get enough beer for everyone, 
Uh, during the lunch we will have uh, sheets of paper, just put a name or whatever there so we count how many beers do we need to pre-order, how many spaces we need to book, please just make sure to put something on the list. Uh, that's cool, yeah. And we have not so much space so uh, in the hall, so please uh, spread through the rooms, uh, use whatever space you see, relax. So again, please uh, applause for Alexander and let's continue. <laughs>